All right, folks, we're joined now by former Secretary of Agriculture, former Governor of Iowa, Tom Vilsack, current President and CEO of the Dairy Export Council. Now, Mr. Vilsack, as we look at what has transpired in Washington, D.C. over the past six months, we have seen NAFTA really rise into prominence. Of course, that was much talked about during the campaign. Now that we're actually beginning to make steps towards a renegotiation of NAFTA with our trading partners, Canada and Mexico, how does Dairy Export Council envision these proceedings going? Well, our hope, Mark, is that we basically see uh, a preservation of what's working in Mexico because it's our number one market, a market that we've seen actually since my visit uh, in the early spring uh, an uptick in exports. Uh, we want to make sure that that market is maintained and, and we also want to make sure that we, we visit with the Mexicans about a thing called geographic indications or indi indicators. Uh, this is an effort by the European Union to try to monopolize certain cheese types based on their ability only to use the name uh, Asiago, Gorgonzola, things of that nature. Pretty much every cheese is well, named not every after cheese, a place. But yeah, it is, but it, but, but they have a, they have a, a list of cheeses that they would like to be able to exclusively market, if you will. Uh, and they're shopping this idea around the world, uh, and they are aggressively trying to get Mexico to participate in a free trade agreement with the EU that would include uh, a restriction against using uh, certain terms. Uh, we obviously think that there is a better way to do this uh, through a trademark system. Uh, and we're deeply concerned that this is going to cut into the high value proposition that cheese represents. So as we discuss a modernization and an improvement in NAFTA, we'd like to see perhaps the, uh, the efforts of the Trans-Pacific Partnership in this area, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, incorporated into a modernized NAFTA agreement so that that would provide greater protections on the GIs um, and, and what Europe's trying to do. Now, on in the, your conversations with Mexican officials, have they been receptive to this EU free trade agreement? Is that something uh, you can speculate on for the, us a the, little bit? They are, and they are also shrewd negotiators. Uh, they are saying, look, we've got a negotiation going with you, U.S. We've got a negotiating going on going with the EU. Who's going to make the best deal? Who's going to get to us first? And so that's why it's important and necessary that we get this modernization effort underway and that we are very clear uh, about preserving what's working uh, and perhaps getting into that agreement uh, some kind of due process uh, process by which we would be notified in advance of any GI being awarded uh, so that we could basically say, hey, wait a second, that's a common name. Uh, you shouldn't provide GI protection. Uh, on the uh, north of the border, yes. it's a completely different circumstance. And north of the border, last time we were, had the opportunity to speak with you, it was right after you had assumed the role of president and CEO. And in that time, we've seen Canada uh, ruffle some feathers in the U.S. dairy industry with their new classification system and the exclusion, for intents and purposes, of ultra-filtered milk from U.S. producers. How does that play into, how does that complicate any sort of NAFTA renegotiation? Well, it requires, I think, the administration to take a firm stand on the way in which uh, Canada uses its supply side uh, and supply management program. Uh, essentially what happens is whenever America begins to get a foothold in that Canadian market, the, the, the policy gets changed, uh, a new classification, new category, a new standard, new specifications are developed by the Canadian government, and that results in us not being able to uh, export as much into Canada as we would be able to. And it's also detrimental to Canadian consumers. They pay a substantially greater amount for their dairy products than they should because there just isn't competition. So in this last effort, uh, Canada essentially saw us uh, utilize ultra-filtered milk uh, to provide a, a less expensive option for processors in Canada. So they essentially created a, an incentive. They created an opportunity for uh, Canadian dairy uh, to, be un to undercut the world market provide a, a less expensive option than ultra-filtered milk from the U.S. Uh, and essentially provided a opportunity for uh, Canadian dairy. This creates two problems. One, we don't get the ultra-filtered milk into the Canadian market. And two, it creates uh, a, a lot of powder, a surplus powder in Canada, which they are now putting on the world market at below world prices so that it impacts not only uh, the ultra-filtered milk sales, but also powder sales around the world. So that has a double impact uh, on our producers. And this is something that absolutely has to be dealt with in any modernization or restructuring of NAFTA in terms of the dairy industry and in terms of agriculture. So we have been very uh, insistent and very persistent in communicating with members of Congress and the administration the importance of getting this issue uh, on the front burner. Uh, and I think we've finally gotten the attention of the folks in Canada. 
Uh, they are beginning to respond. They're coming down here, talking to uh, governors uh, from Wisconsin and New York, uh, trying to suggest that, uh, well, what's everybody worried about? Exports in Canada are, are, are high, they're, they're increasing, and it's a shell game because when we export into Canada, oftentimes what happens, it gets processed and then gets re-exported, if you will, back into the U.S. and evaluated. We're shipping bulk milk into Canada, right. counts as a dairy export, and then they're shipping right. processed product into the U.S., counts and that, as an export. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to ship it into the uh, into a country and it's supposed to be used in that country and, and used by consumers in that country. So I think it's a little disingenuous for them to suggest that their exports are, 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 are up, our exports to them are up. So I, I think there's a lot of conversation that has to take place. I appreciate the fact that Secretary Purdue recently met with his counterparts in Mexico and Canada. I'm sure there was a frank conversation and exchange of ideas. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, bottom line, we want to preserve what's working and we want to correct what isn't. Now, you mentioned the geographic indicators as uh, an issue we're dealing with in Mexico. In Canada, with their closer ties to Great Britain and then the EU, is geographic indicators also an issue north of the border? Well, the sad reality is that they've agreed with the EU uh, in a system which is, again, somewhat of a shell game. They have grandfathered in their current processing facilities. They're able to continue using these terms. But any new processing facility that's developed in Canada will be prohibited from using uh, a certain number of, of these terms. So they've essentially bought into the EU system. And again, uh, as you look at long term, uh, the dairy industry, obviously cheese is a significant issue in terms of opportunities for exports. If we allow the European Union to have an exclusive right to use certain terms, it essentially gives them the ability to dictate price for, the, for those types of cheeses. Uh, it's just not very appealing if you have Asiago uh, from, from the EU in, in one part of the, uh, the counter, and then it's sort of like maybe, you know, sort of like really close to almost, yeah. it really is, but, Pseudo we can't, but we can't say it. I, I, next to it, I, I, consumers are going to say, I'll take the real thing, I, not knowing that in fact they have a choice between two real things. Um, and they may end up paying a little bit more for that. And so it ends up creating a, a tremendous market advantage for the EU across the board. Uh, and that's, that's what we're concerned about. And we don't think it's fair. Uh, we think there needs to be a system that allows uh, any country to come in and say, wait a second, that has been in use for so long, it is now a common name and it shouldn't be protected. Now, is that a place where the WTO, World Trade Organization, can step in or is this, this is a wholly separate issue? It's a wholly separate issue okay. and it's not something that uh, lends itself because there are certain circumstances uh, throughout uh, agriculture where we have had geographic indicators, champagne is an mm -hmm. example, for uh, and, and so there are certain uh, areas of agriculture where this is already a, an accepted practice. The key here is having a process by which you can uh, uh, essentially question whether or not something is in fact uh, a geographic indicator or, or is it a common name. Uh, and there is a, 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 an agreement called the Lisbon Agreement in which a number of countries have agreed to a process. The only problem with it is that th there's a list that's published, but nobody knows when the list is being published. Nobody knows where the list is. And, it, and if you don't respond to it within a certain period of time, then it is deemed to be accepted. Well, if you don't know when things are being published and you don't know where they're being published, how do you know when the time starts? So it, it's really not a very effective system, and it's one that has caused our dairy industry deep concern. As we become much more of an exporter, uh, I think the, 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 the key message here is U.S. dairy has finally understood that in the long term, its future rides not just on increasing consumption domestically, but also in exports, and the reason being that our producers continue to be incredible at what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a safe, secure, sustainably produced product, uh, and they've got a lot of it. And the question is, how do we make sure that we maintain stable and secure markets? Now, while we're on the topic of Europe, there was much conversation uh, before the election cycle about TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, a free trade agreement between the U.S. and the, the EU. It, where does that stand today? Is that still in the works? Is it on the back burner? Is, is it anything you're watching? I think uh, with Brexit, uh, the U.K.'s uh, leaving the, the, the EU, others uh, thinking or contemplating, uh, I'm not sure that that's on the front burner. I, I suspect that if there is anything with reference to uh, Europe uh, and the UK, it's probably a free trade agreement negotiation between the US and the UK. Uh, I will tell you that TTIP, uh, as hard as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement was to form uh, with a number of countries, the TTIP uh, 
uh, negotiations will be extremely difficult in agriculture, not the least of which is dairy and then the issue of genetically modified crops, a big, big issue and one where there's a serious division uh, between the U.S. and the EU. Okay. Now let's take a step out. Let's look at the other side of the world because I know you have recently done some traveling. You went over to Asia, well, visited a lot of places in Asia and Southeast Asia. What was your, what did you bring back with you? What was your take home for meeting with those Asian markets? Well, I think first that U.S. dairy, uh, because we have only been in the export market for, say, two, two decades. Our competitors in New Zealand, EU, have been in that export market in Asia for 50 years. So we obviously have some catch up. Uh, and I think the market still perceives the U.S. dairy industry as one that's primarily domestically focused. So it's important for us and necessary for us uh, to, to change that image. Uh, I think secondly, uh, it takes, you got to be there. You have to have people there working every single day promoting U.S. dairy. As we have in Mexico, uh, you know, the, the, there's a good uh, example there where in Mexico we created greater demand for dairy products generally. It was beneficial to Mexican producers, but it also created an export market for us. So in order to do that, you have to have people. Uh, you have to have people in country constantly looking for ways to promote market, constantly understanding the nuances. Uh, the other thing I picked up from my visit is every country is slightly different in terms of what their interests are relative to dairy. Now, you, you, there's tremendous opportunity here. Uh, China, mm -hmm. uh, take China. 18 million new Chinese babies born every year. So when you start thinking about infant formula, dairy product, uh, key dairy product, that's 18 million new consumers every single year, one country. Yeah. Uh, we in the U.S. consume uh, a pizza uh, about once every seven days. In China, it's once every 45 days. Now, if you start doing the numbers and you can move from once out of four, or 45 days to once every 30 days or once every two weeks, you're talking about a whole lot of cheese. Yeah. A whole lot of cheese. Um, Chinese are... I guess tired of drinking tea after several thousand years, they're beginning to convert to coffee. Uh, Starbucks has seven, eight hundred stores. Uh, Yum China uh, has uh, 7,500 locations in China today. Uh, they want to get to 20,000. Uh, interesting factoid. You know what the toughest reservation is on New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve in China in terms of a dinner reservation? I don't know. Well, I would have thought it would be a place that was serving, you know, exquisite Chinese cuisine. Mm -hmm. It's actually, I'm told, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> now, their, their Kentucky Fried Chickens are a little different than ours. Okay. Uh, they got the tablecloths. Uh, oh. you, can, you, you can have a drink. Uh, you can have a glass of wine with your Kentucky Fried Chicken. It is the toughest place to get a reservation. I'll be darned. Yeah. So, you know, world's, world's different. You know, yes. di di different things, different tastes. Uh, well, we want to get uh, the, the, those folks at Yum China don't want to just sell chicken or through their Pizza Hut uh, and Taco Bell Enterprises, uh, cheese and pizza and so forth, they don't want to just sell that, they want to sell coffee. Because they look at Starbucks and they realize that Starbucks has one-tenth of the number of stores but sells seven times more coffee. Well, you start thinking about uh, uh, coffee drinkers in, in China, 1.2 billion coffee drinkers, then you're talking about a lot of cream mm -hmm. and a lot of milk and a lot of frappuccinos and things of that nature. So uh, tremendous market opportunity. Uh, but a lot of competition, and we've got to, we've got to step up our game. Uh, we have to invest more resources in people uh, to better understand the market uh, and to be able to do more promotions and marketing of U.S. dairy. How does that happen? How do you get more people invested and, and placed in those markets that are emerging as, as powerhouses for U.S. dairy industry? Well, convincing folks back here that it, it's, it's how we will stabilize the market over time. I mean, if you take a look at what the projections are for dairy production, and what they are domestically for consuming dairy, you're going to realize that if you want stable prices, exports have to be part of the game. And in, we saw this uh, in 2009 when exports dipped. We had one of the worst years we've seen in the dairy industry in 2014 when we hit record levels of exports. Um, the, dairy, the dairy industry in this country was very, uh, was very solid. So exports, uh, an understanding and appreciation here in the U.S. that farm income, um, when you look at uh, exports in the last 10, 15 years, it's added about $1.25 per 100 weight of dairy products being produced, milk being produced. That's 36 billion additional revenue dollars that dairy farmers uh, received. And it's not just dairy farmers, it's also plants and, and jobs. We got nearly 1,300 processing facilities in this country. Every time you sell a gallon of milk someplace, it's gonna help every processor, every dairy producer. 
Uh, there are nearly 100,000 jobs that are directly connected to ag exports. Um, you know, I think of Swiss Valley here uh, in Iowa. Uh, they were able to expand their plant because of exports, created a, a few more jobs. All of that has repercussions uh, throughout the country. So first and foremost is explaining to people it's about stable income, it's about jobs. Uh, and then getting them to commit resources through the checkoff uh, to be able to expand on what we have done in the last 15 years. We've, we've done a great job building up to 15, roughly 15 percent of, of, of volume. We need to get to 20 percent uh, in order to keep those prices where they need to be, in order to keep nearly 42,000 farming operations in business. Now, in that push to get to 20 percent, there has been a lot of news over the past several weeks about China's finally lifting the ban on U.S. beef moving into that country. And somewhat overshadowed by that was another announcement that China made concerning U.S. dairy processors. Could you tell us a little bit about what that change was? You know, it's interesting on the beef side. We, we're already selling beef into China. We just are selling it in an indirect way. Either that or the Vietnamese are eating a tremendous right. amount of beef the people per person. In Hong Kong sure are <laughs> eating a lot of beef as well, yes. So, uh, but, but this was, this was on, on, the, on the milk side, dairy side, a, a big opportunity for us. Um, and it's complicated because China came out a couple of years ago with a different set of, of requirements for their certification for exports. Uh, and it basically requires uh, processing plants to be able to meet certain specifications that the Chinese have set forth. Um, and then they need to register their plant. They need to be verified that they're meeting those specifications before they can put product in, in, into the market. There are probably over 200 facilities, 200 plants in the U.S. that have wanted to do this but have not received permission because they just simply can't get on the registration list. Uh, the reason they couldn't get on the list was because there was a lack of clarity, a lack of certainty about precisely what the process was going to be and what the requirements were. Well, this MOU that was signed uh, this month between China and our Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, basically lays out a process by which the FDA and uh, their Chinese counterparts will work collaboratively together to get these t over 200 plants, the, the information, the guidance, uh, the, the, the process by which they can qualify to get on the list. And that's going to create opportunities for them to sell uh, across the board in terms of, of everything from fluid milk to cheese to ingredients to whey to lacto, all, all across the board, all the products that we can sell, and that creates a, a tremendous opportunity for us in China. Um, but it's not just China. <clears throat> uh, there are tremendous opportunities for us in Southeast Asia as well. Um, I mentioned Yum China. There's also uh, a Yum organization in Singapore that basically does business in Indonesia and Malaysia and mm -hmm. Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, emerging middle classes in Asia. And all of those <coughs> countries have drastically different cultures. Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim-majority country. Vietnam, you know, for a long time a communist country. How does, does dairy consumption change as those middle classes are rising? Well, you've got, in Indonesia, you've got to be very uh, concerned about halal uh, requirements. Uh, and each country has a slightly different definition of what that actually means. Uh, so there has to be, that's why, why we have an organization like the U.S. Dairy Export Council is that we basically have an export guide. Every day we are constantly uh, combing uh, the re regulations and rules in these individual countries to give our exporters, uh, to give our processing facilities the up-to-date information on precisely what they need to do to be able to uh, comply and get into that market. Uh, again, it, it, it's se several levels. I mean, in one case you want to be in the food service, you want to be in restaurants, you want to be uh, in those, uh, those franchise uh, restaurants. But in each country, the franchise system is different. Uh, for example, in Yum China, uh, it's not the head organization that calls the shots, it's every franchisee calls the shots. Well, that's 7,500 different organizations that you have to reach out to. That's, a, that's not easy to do. Uh, and again, that's why you need more people, uh, you, need, you need presence, you need, we need to up our game if we're truly interested in expanding exports. And I think at the end of the day, we think if we get from 15% uh, to 20%, we're talking about another two to two and a half billion dollars of additional revenue for dairy farmers. Uh, and to give you a sense of that, right now we're exporting somewhere between four and a half to five billion. So if that, support, if that five billion is supporting 100,000 jobs, you add another two billion, you're talking about more jobs and you're obviously talking about uh, continuing uh, the bottom line improvement for dairy, uh, for dairy in the U.S. Let's look at the low-hanging fruit when it comes to dairy exports. Um, as you look towards Asia and Southeast Asia is the immediate area of uh, 
outside North American growth. <clears throat> is it going to be in the form of powder? Is it cheese? Is it butter? Do we sell much fluid milk? Into that might be a, a silly question. Well, we don't sell a Do lot. Do we load of, tankers? Yeah, with we milk? don't sell a lot of fluid milk. Okay. Uh, and the butter issue, you know, there's such a tremendous demand here in the U.S. Uh, for butter fat that uh, we're, we're not competitively priced oftentimes okay. in that market. But we are very competitively priced uh, in powder. Uh, and what's important about powder is to understand what's happening within that industry. We're becoming better at removing the protein uh, from, uh, from dairy, uh, from milk, and being able to put it into a, a powder that can be used in nutritional drinks, sports drinks. Uh, and a, as we become more refined in that area, we, can, we, we create a product that before we thought was of very little value, now becomes very high value. I mean, if you see, if you go to any of these fitness places, you'll see these large containers of whey, large containers of protein concentrate, uh, it, pretty expensive. Um, and so there's a tremendous uh, emerging market across Asia, um, and for a multitude of different reasons. In Japan, it, it may be because of an aging population uh, and the fact that they only have 6,250 dairy farmers left in that country. Um, so they're looking for uh, additional supply. Uh, in China, it may be, uh, uh, you know, youth and sports. Uh, so it, it's really understanding each individual country and having an understanding. So when you look at the Asian market, I think that there are probably four areas. There's South Korea, where we have a free trade agreement where we're very competitive. There's Japan, where we would have had the benefit of TPP, reduced tariffs. We're still faced with some tariff issues in Japan. That's why negotiations on a bilateral agreement become incredibly important. Uh, if if those need to happen, they need to happen soon because, again, Japan is also negotiating with the EU, also discussing um, the issue of geographic indications and, and, and is, uh, you know, the EU is not as much interested in market access as they are in the GI issue. So we have ceded to, you, to the EU our market access uh, negotiations for all intents and purposes unless we become very aggressive in our efforts in Japan. So Japan, great opportunity, but we got to get going uh, with our negotiations. China, opening up uh, this MOU, I think, is going to be helpful. Uh, and then there's Southeast Asia through Singapore, uh, accessing all those other Southeast Asian countries and having a better understanding of what the food service industry wants. I think a lot of people, when they think of dairy, they want us to be in the retail space. You really have to get people conditioned to buying, uh, to, to liking U.S. dairy products, to understanding uh, what U.S. dairy is. You do that by making sure that when they go to the restaurant, uh, when they go to a high-end restaurant uh, or even uh, a franchise restaurant that they're experiencing U.S. dairy, you market that. In the same way, uh, to a certain extent, Mark, that we're reminding people now in the U.S. with our Undeniably Dairy uh, initiative that was launched June 1 on, on World Milk Day, uh, an opportunity for us to reconnect the American consumers with the role that dairy has played in their life, uh, the enjoyment, the taste, the fun that's connection, connected with dairy, but also reminding folks of the nutritional value. Uh, you know, as we look at uh, obesity issues, it may surprise folks that uh, maybe a glass of milk might be a strategy in keeping your weight down as opposed to adding weight, um, and certainly a, an option in terms of a sugar drink, for example. So there's just a lot, a lot of good work being done, uh, a lot of uh, interesting, uh, conversations taking place about dairy. I was in a group not connected with dairy uh, a couple of days ago, uh, and I can see that our, our program here is already working. Uh, they were discussing the fact that 7% of Americans believe that chocolate milk came from brown cows. So, <laughs> and some of it does. Jerseys are, of course, brown. Right, yeah. But, but, I, uh, but yeah. But I, 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 <laughs> no, I don't think they had a much breed <laughs> differentiation on their minds. Right, right. Wow. So, it's, uh, so there's a little work for us to do, right? A little work for us to do. But I think it's a, a fun way of getting people engaged in the conversation. And again, reminding them that virtually every family uh, opportunity, whether it's a celebration or whether it's a, a, a you know, tragedy that you're dealing with in your family, dairy is always at the center. Dairy's always there to help through a crisis. Dairy's always there to celebrate, uh, uh, you know, a birthday or a, a great achievement. Uh, and so it's connecting emotionally to a product. And it, and it also gives us an opportunity to remind people of the, the work that our dairy farmers are doing in terms of sustainable practices, uh, work they do to uh, care for their animals. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for us to reinforce the sustainability argument as well. As you look out one, two, five years into the future, what are your top three priorities when it comes to dairy exports? Well, I, I think it's, it's about volume and value, uh, making sure that we really aggressively create greater presence in all of these emerging markets. 
uh, promoting and marketing U.S. dairy, number one. Number two, making sure that we change the image of U.S. dairy uh, in these countries from a, you know, a sort of last resort exporter of a commodity to a preferred exporter, to a consistent exporter, to a high value exporter. Uh, and then I would hope that we would see uh, both in volume and in value uh, an increase from 14 to 15 percent of our milk being produced in this country uh, to 20 percent of our milk being produced in this country in some way finding its way around the world. Here's the benefit to the country from this, and I think it's sometimes often uh, not fully appreciated. When we export U.S. dairy, and for that matter when we export U.S. agriculture products anywhere in the world, we're not just exporting that commodity. We're not just exporting that powder or that cheese. We're exporting the American brand, uh, the American brand of innovation, uh, the American brand of sustainability and concern for uh, the environment and for, uh, for our animals. And I think that's a, a positive message for us to be able to reinforce as many times and as often in as many places as we possibly can. So. When we talk about these Asia markets, we don't want to forget there's also a tremendous market in North Africa and the Middle East, uh, particularly for some of our high value added products. And so there's a place where it's sort of open for business. It's open for competition. Nobody's been there for 50 years, if you will. Uh, it's a place where we have, a, I think, a chance to really change the image of the U.S. So uh, we'll be focusing on preserving what's working in Mexico, opening up that market in Canada, creating new market opportunities in Asia and creating a, a, a real presence in the, in the Middle East and North Africa. Now, as you talk about exporting the American brand, one of the actions that occurred under your past boss, President Obama, was opening up trade into the nation of Cuba. And now here this last week, uh, President Trump rescinded most of that. What impact, if any, is that going to have on the dairy export business? I think it's a lost opportunity. And I think, uh, candidly, I don't think it had anything to do with anything but politics, um, and it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, we've tried squeezing Cuba. Uh, we've tried that for 60 plus years uh, to try to do something to the Castro family, the Castro brothers. I don't think it's worked particularly well. Uh, uh, and I think that President Obama saw an opportunity to create a dialogue. And I think he understood what, which is, you know, we've seen this in other places around the world. You know, think about this, Mark. The United States has a tremendous capacity to make friends out of enemies. Mm -hmm. Following World War II, who are some of our strongest allies today? Japan and Germany. Um, we war went to war with Mexico. We have a strong relationship with Mexico. Uh, we went to war with Vietnam. Yeah. And now the Vietnamese are anxious to do business with America. But for some reason we've carved out this one little island 90 miles off our shore that we ought to be dominating in terms of agricultural sales and we've sort of made it so difficult and so hard that we can't compete. And it's a, a billion dollar plus market opportunity for American agriculture and we're essentially saying to Europe, uh, to the New Zealand, to our competitors, you can, you, can, you can control this market 90 miles off our shore. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and I think it was uh, you know, a purely political decision on the part of the administration. Uh, and I, I, I know that I have to be a little bit careful about being too too critical, but on this one, I think that they made the wrong call. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to take a turn to a different page. Look back on your tenure as Secretary of Agriculture. What what policies, what programs were you able to implement to increase or to spur the growth of the organic food movement in this country? Well, since we're talking about exports, uh, let's stay on that topic. I mean, we we had the eight best years in exports of agriculture in the history of the country and part of that was our ability to enter into equivalency agreements for organically produced products here in the U.S. Uh, and conversely to be able to allow the import uh, from other countries. Uh, and it also ties to Cuba because I think Cuba had the opportunity in agriculture for sort of an exchange where we would sell them base commodities. They, would, they, they, because they haven't done much with their land for 50 years, would be in a great position to be an organic producer of high value ag products. So it could have been a win-win for uh, Cuban producers and for our producers. Uh, so on the organic side, it, that was sort of one thing that we did was to create equivalency agreements with Japan, with Korea, uh, with, uh, with the EU. Uh, we were in the process of negotiating one with Mexico. Makes it easier for us to have a free flow of, of organic product in and out of the country. Uh, I think the second thing we did was to uh, elevate its stature within the Department of Agriculture and create uh, a group of people dedicated to looking at ways in which market opportunities could be expanded. We 
invested in the expansion of farmers markets. Uh, we invested in, in food hubs that created an aggregation site uh, for organic, so it helped uh, create additional market opportunities. We had a, a food insecurity nut uh, nutrition initiative that was focused on SNAP families, giving them the opportunities to use their SNAP card to purchase organic but not be overwhelmed by the cost because we would partner with private foundations that would essentially, for every dollar we spent in SNAP, they would match it up to a certain five, ten bucks. Uh, so it gave people an opportunity. Uh, we, we, we strengthened the brand. Uh, we made sure that there were specific rules and regulations uh, impacting and affecting how, how you get that organic certification. Uh, we were very defensive, I think, of, of making sure that brands and the value of that brand stayed solid. Um, and I think we, we also put more research money into organic than had ever been put in before. Uh, there was, uh, I think, $100 million in the uh, 2014 Farm Bill that was dedicated to organic research. So uh, we also had a specific uh, carve out uh, of equip resources for conservation uh, for uh, orga organic producers. And, we, and as I left, what we were working on was a transition pricing mechanism. Uh, part of the challenge with converting more acres to organic, despite the fact there's just tremendous demand for this today, uh, is that you have to ask a farmer, a landowner, to basically go three years and change dramatically what they're doing with their land. Um, that's hard. It's hard. And during that transition period, farmers have to practice the organic principles, so right. no, no pesticides, none of the, uh, the approved, uh, non-approved for organics, yet at the same time they can't market it as right. organic, organic right. so they're not reaping that economic so not, benefit. Right, they get a commodity gotcha. price, uh, in ex and, and, but they incur you know, significant expense. So what we've suggested was that perhaps there is a way in which you could increase the value of that commodity each year as it's transitioning so that you would, you know, it's not organic, but it's phase one, phase two, phase three of organic. Uh, could you create some kind of pricing mechanism, some kind of labeling process that would allow people to, to get some value, some additional value that would provide uh, another uh, incentive for people who are thinking about doing this to be able to do it without necessarily losing the farm. And where did that land? Well, it's still, it was in the process in, of okay. being developed and, and I'm not sure what, what's currently uh, I think Secretary Purdue, um, I, I really feel for him because he doesn't have any of his undersecretaries, he doesn't have any of his major uh, key political appointees in place and won't for a considerable period of time. That really makes it hard. And when you stepped into that role, how long did it take to get the full, all the political appointees or at least a, a, a critical mass of them approved? I think I had most of my uh, folks in place uh, certainly by, by now, oh, wow. uh, but perhaps even sooner, uh, okay. a couple of months. Uh, I was fortunate because I got on the job the day after the president was inaugurated. Um, Governor Purdue, now Secretary Purdue, had to wait for a number of months. So that really, and, you know, and that impacts a lot, a lot of things. It impacts, um, just to give you a sense of this, in, or, in order to get people approved, they have to be vetted by the FBI. And you think, well, that's, you know, how hard is that? Well, they literally ask you to identify every place that you've lived, every place that you've worked in your life. And they actually go back and talk to people. So in my case, uh, I worked at a Exxon gas station in 1971 for Tommy Fall. Tommy Fall is now retired. Uh, in 2009, 2008, Tommy Fall, December of 2008, Tommy Fall sitting in his recliner watching a Steeler game and the phone rings and it's the FBI. Well, first of all, it's a good thing that <laughs> Tommy didn't have a heart attack, you know, when he, when he, this is the FBI. And they, they wanted to ask about a kid who had worked at his gas station 40 years ago. Now, fortunately, he didn't get me confused with somebody else. <laughs> right? um, so, he, he, you know, he said, oh, he's a great guy. He didn't ever said to overthrow the government and all that stuff. So, the, so that shows you that, the, okay. But if, if Secretary Purdue isn't Secretary Purdue from day one, and you've got a Secretary of State's appointed, a Secretary of Defense, they're clamoring for their people also. So now you've got a queue, okay? You've got Defense, you've got State, you've got Commerce, you've got Treasury. Here's Ag back here. So you, all these people have to go through that process before they even get to our folks. So there's, there's that. Then there's the budget. So when the Secretary's not there with a political eye, essentially, the bureaucrats in OMB take over and they go, well, you know, ag doesn't need as much money, so they propose a 21% cut in the ag. I'm pretty sure that if Secretary Purdue had been there, that that 21% uh, 
budget would not have been a 21% cut. I, I don't know what it would have been, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been that high. There would have been a voice at the table. There would have been a voice at the table, and he would have been saying, well, you can't do that, or this is a bad idea, or you, you know, it, it, which is what I had to do, right? So it, he's really, really in a tough spot. And, uh, and, it, and then there's the expectation that a new guy, he travels around, he's got to talk to people. He's got this NAFTA renegotiation. So there's a lot on his plate, and he really does need help. Well, Mr. Vilsack, thank you so much for taking the time to come in and talk to us and fill us in on what all is happening in the world as it relates to dairy. It sounds like there is a lot that American dairy producers should be excited about as we look to the future. I think so. Thank you so much. You bet.